episode 43 begins with what is at this point a very familiar cold open that casually unravels the very fabric of how we perceive the story up to this point. But before we get to that, we just see Aaron waking up and him being entirely chained up, again establishing that false sense of freedom and the puppet imagery we talked about last time. Though Historia then walks up, with the episode immediately framing it as if she was on Rod's side. Right away, she says that they were completely wrong about her father, which naturally makes us ask, well, okay, but why the secrecy? Why did he work with the Council to begin with? Or if they too were just a part of his plan, well, then what's the endgame? In hindsight, all of these questions seem very silly, but don't forget, this is still Attack on Titan. Good guys have nonchalantly revealed that they are just about the biggest bad guys, while some less savory individuals have turned out to be better than we thought, right? In the context of this episode, it just plants that seed of doubts and really madness in our minds. With everything we're about to learn, the so-called enemy is literally staring right back at us in the mirror. So at this point, it's not even a question of truth, but rather a what's even real anymore and are there other memories that are just sealed away? And on that note, Anna remembers seeing them hug, but also worrying about Armin and the others, saying that he has no idea how long it's been. The obvious interpretation here is that this is that meme of you waking up after a daytime nap, but not knowing whether two hours have passed or maybe 2,000 years. But uh, in-universe, that is also kind of true for Aaron. He just saw through Frida's eyes, and he now very explicitly says, I feel like I've been here before. Indeed you have, Aaron, not just because you sent Grisha here, but also because you are kinda sorta Frida, so technically, you kinda sent yourself to eat yourself. Yeah, actually that's pretty weird, so let's not think about that, but point being that, for Aaron, all of these points in time exist simultaneously. So as soon as he'd come in contact with Historia here, and later during the coronation, all of those memories lying deep in his subconscious would surface, and, well, we all know what happens next. Though once again, in classic Attack on Titan fashion, we do not linger on any of it. Rod just casually says, yes, you haven't been here before, but it's not surprising that you recognize this place. And with no explanation whatsoever, he just reaches out. And suddenly, Aaron is blasted by memories all of which are presented from a first-person view through Grisha's eyes, which again establishes that surreal out-of-body experience that this entire sequence is going for. We see him killing everyone in the Crystal Catacombs, something that of course started this entire Founding Titan debacle to begin with. And importantly, it also connects Aaron himself to orchestrating this entire thing. I think that fear we see in his eyes stems not just from witnessing these cruel acts of violence, but also the fact that, amongst those flashes of Grisha's memories, it is entirely possible that his own point of view is also mixed in there. Also a detail that is very easy to overlook now that it's no longer a mystery, is that this scene right here already tells us that Eren doesn't have just one Titan, he has two. Grisha was a shifter, Frida was a shifter, Titans are transferred when the shifter is eaten, and Eren ate Grisha. Also, also, as we already talked about way, way back in Trost, this is where Eren gets his handbiting technique from. If you go through the series, minus Burrito and Utgard, who didn't really transform anyway, a overwhelming majority of shifters use some other means to transform, be it a knife, a ring, or whatever else. Aaron, on the other hand, always bites his hand even before he has any real idea of how his power works. So again, it's that founding titan just transcending time and those memories all bleeding together. He also catches a glimpse of Keith, not as the instructor he knows very well, but as a scout. Considering what we know of the scouts and how, most of the time, they only leave the scouts when they, well, leave this plane of existence, this sparks an entirely new mystery as to what happened to him and how he ended up in the instructor role. Later, we'd of course learn that he and Grisha had a somewhat troubled relationship, leading him to sabotaging Eren's gear back in Season 1 and a whole bunch of other things we'll get to later in the season. We also get the 100% concrete confirmation that the person who Eren ate to get his Titan is indeed Grisha finally wrapping up that mystery that had been brewing since episode 2. But again, we have that horrific out-of-body experience where Eren sees himself injected, transform, and himself eating his own father. Following this point, many of the conversations we'll be having around Eren will harken back to this warped perception of time and really of oneself. For the return to Shiganshin arc, this will be a smaller point, but as soon as we reach the basement and the Astoria scene happens, Eren's mind just becomes a total blur, and these scenes right here I think demonstrate that beautifully. If the past, present, and future all exist simultaneously, nothing is a surprise and nothing warrants any emotion. Everything that has ever been and ever will be already is. It's just completely impossible to wrap your head around. On top of that, there's the depersonalization angle for Eren. 
The series of course presents this in a very fantasy manner of him quite literally seeing through someone else's eyes. But I think that detachment from oneself warrants an equal amount of numbness. If you see yourself as just this puppet that you occasionally embody and you've seen thousands of these puppets before, well, which, if any, really matter anymore? How can you separate all of those visions from what is reality? What if this Aaron is actually a vision and he was Grisha all along? It just plants this impossible doubt of reality itself. Something we'd of course see vocalized far, far later with the Aaron Armin conversation. Finally, moving into the title of the episode, Sin, I think this one has a couple of interpretations. The first and most obvious one is everything that Grisha does, because, you know, cannibalism. That aside though, with Frida being the true queen of the walls, Grisha also becomes a usurper, and not just a usurper, but a totally independent, backstabby kind of usurper. So in the context of the walls and the monarchy, very much a sin as well. And lastly, in the Christus, that of course being Emir's story, there's the deal with the devil and the apple, which is a pretty obvious nod to the Forbidden Fruit and the original Sin. Very much in line with the story of Attack on Titan, the original Sin is also said to be a representation of free will, or the lack thereof. Attack on Titan of course explores the latter. As soon as Emir awakened the power of the Titans, her 2000 year long journey began, with everything from Fritz's wars to Grisha's sins and eventually Aaron's life. Moving into the episode itself, CGI horses. Sorry, 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 sorry. I just wanted to make sure everyone's still awake. I didn't mean to scare you like that. Here we really begin to dive into that entirely new dimension that is now Frida. She now becomes this connective thread tying together Aaron's and Astoria's stories only from directly opposing sides. Aaron is the Titan, the monster who tore apart everything, including Frida herself, so very fittingly, he holds the Founding Titan. Astoria, on the other hand, is the true royal. Currently, a somewhat naive inheritor to the crown, but one who lost the single closest person to her to said monster. Both are basically two halves of Frida. And the direction for this entire sequence is also just impeccable and is another excellent example of the series constantly managing the expectations and emotions of the viewer. We just saw Aaron eat his own dad and so rightfully, Aaron himself is also horrified. But suddenly, we smash cut to Astoria. Someone who was completely shunned by her true mother and father, only for her to now learn of Frida, the only one who clearly loved and cared for her. The guitar strums in the background, the dreamy color palettes, it paints this idyllic image that is directly opposed to Aaron. <laughs> But at the same time, there are still these shots to create this uncrossable distance. We see them from a bird's eye view, as if to tell us that we are still not getting the full story and that we are just getting a peek from a long, long ways off. And while it is this hazy, picturesque flashback, to me, and this might totally be me just crowbarring in hindsight, it feels oddly cold and almost distorted in the same way that the final poster of the series also has this weird, surreal vibe to it. It is a very tender moment between Frida and Astoria, but it also has this constant uneasiness to it, which is just amplified tenfold in hindsight. And I also think there's a conversation to be had around Frida's influence on Astoria and how that mirroring to Amir actually plays out. We know that the true Amir never meant to become this god of destruction. She was just a simple girl who craved a human connection but was eventually just used as Fritz's war machine. We also know that sometime later, Carl Fritz made the vow to renounce war in turn, stopping every single royal successor of the Founding Titan from using it as this retaliatory power. And eventually, we know that Aaron kind of stomps the entire world because he was never bound by that vow. So returning to Astoria, I think in many ways, even though she never got the Founding Titan and was never upheld to that absolute vow, she still becomes the true successor of that vow of peace. While she obviously failed to stop Aaron, she joins the world in rebuilding. Her daughter isn't born to just fuel that war machine further, her family doesn't exist with the sole purpose of upholding royalty, and I mean, her husband is just a farmer. All problems and fear are not just magically erased, I mean, the Jaegerists do still exist. But she uses the power she has to just make sure that no one who fought against Aaron faces any repercussions from his loyalists. It shows us that it doesn't take some magical vow to maintain at least some level of peace. At the end of the day, there are people making choices on both sides, so perhaps because of Frida's counsel, Historia is the first true royal to actually hear its message. Though with that, just like we've already seen in the ED, Historia's memories are wiped. 
and note how when the wind blows in, the pages of the book very quickly shoot forward. Very literally showing us that we are jumping between the pages of this very, very long story. Wait a minute, that is a very long story, almost as if we still haven't even seen the start of it, huh? The music here of a story actually remembering is just exquisite though. Those sad strings just have that super formal but oddly cold and almost lonely vibe to them. It's as if there are instruments missing from it, and it's just this lonely melody occasionally cutting through the silence. But okay, real quick, let me just ruin this scene for you forever, because this frame right here is the most unintentionally funny thing I have ever seen in my life. It's this super sorrowful moment of loss and fear, with the story just asking what happened to the only person who ever cared for her. But then the director is like, well, she's in Aaron's stomach, obviously. Might be a case of me having watched the series so many times that I'm kind of desensitized to a lot of the horrors, but I was straight up cackling at this. Though as Rod explains what actually happened, we get this constant contrasting of perspectives, as don't forget, it's not just the story of who regained her memories. When Rod explains their side of the story, we focus on Aaron, but then jump to what looks awfully similar to Frida's perspective. But then jump right back to Grisha's. Rod might be explaining them from his perspective, but it is Aaron who actually witnessed all of this. This is him jumping between Frida's eyes and then Grisha's eyes. He is both parties here and the one orchestrating this entire thing. Also, also, a relatively common question that pops up here is why didn't Frida just absolutely annihilate Grisha? She has the Founding Titan, the absolute strongest of the shifters, right? Well, I think there are a few ways of looking at it. The simple explanation is that because of the vow to renounce war, she was always held back. Even if she was on the brink of death, she quite literally could not resort to using the Founder's power because she is bound by the vow. It may seem silly, but as far as we know, the vow is indeed absolute. It isn't just them pinky promising not to do it, it literally like controls their brain. That's exactly why Zeke orchestrated the entire Aaron plan, he couldn't have used the Founder by himself. On top of that, Rod himself would say that, despite wielding the Founder, Frida was simply inexperienced in both combat as well as the Titan itself. So even through that lens, it was just an unironic skill issue. Though an alternate and a bit more convoluted way of thinking about it is that ultimately, Aaron is the one pulling the strings here. So Grisha could be hitting perfect counters, Frida could just be debuffed by Aaron and a number of other permutations that eventually decide the fight. Just like we've already seen them peering into the mirror and as he would straight up say in the final episode, for the wielders of the Founding Titan, these points in time all exist simultaneously and are absolutely impossible to change. So from that perspective, it's just kind of hard to untangle the causal effects of everything, but it could technically be Aaron. Okay, enough nonsense. Frida just wasn't strong enough, it's really not that deep. As we return to the present and that poor music kicks in once again, we get a whole bunch of these close-ups on Aaron and his horrified face. Which again just embodies that out-of-body horror I mentioned a few minutes ago. And the thing I really love here, and this is of course leveraging hindsight, is how the music paints Aaron as the monster and the one responsible for everything we're hearing. But his face paints him as the victim and as an equally horrified party in all of this. One part of him is that young boy watching his own father turn him into a monster. But the other is that same father killing an entire family and turning that little boy into a titan, etc, etc. It just leaves you in this constant state of unease, especially when Rod starts going down the list of each and every person Grisha killed. It's just horrifying. I mean, of course, the Colossal and Armor Titan were responsible for infinitely more deaths. But with Grisha, this isn't just a broken wall and indirect casualties. This just feels so up close and personal, it's really, really dark. This isn't a fight for survival like we saw with Aaron in the cabin or anything. This is Grisha coming here with a goal. But okay, this is overanalyzing, so time for a little more nonsense, and I really mean it this time. If you look at the gleam in Aaron's eyes, you see a dot to his left and a couple more right up ahead, right? Now, we know people look like these glimmering lights through a Titan point of view. So if you look at the future Aaron seen right here, you'll see that Grisha is standing to his left and the rest of the family is directly ahead in that big blob. Okay, I'm sorry, that literally makes no sense. It would have to be flipped first of all. Okay, let's just move on. Oi, 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 oi. And with that, none other than Kenny appears, finally tying up that loose thread from all the way back in the premiere. 
The one thing that I love here is how in almost every single shot of Astoria and Rod, Aaron is always in the frame. I think it just sort of subconsciously establishes him as this omnipresent threat looming just out of sight. He also stands as the separator between Kenny and the true royal bloodline, which of course speaks to Kenny's story and his pursuit of that worldview that Yuri had. And if you really run with that idea, knowing how the story ends, Aaron in the sequence also stands as the separator between peace and the rumbling. First off, if the plan of Historia eating Aaron were to go through, the vow to renounce war would stop Historia from doing anything. On top of that, with the Attack Titan 2 sealed away, there would be absolutely no way of sending back memories or anything like that, so at that point it's kinda GG's. But let's not forget Kenny, because he too wants the Founding Titan. Problem is, he is an Ackerman, so he quite literally cannot even become a Titan. And on top of that, he doesn't have royal blood. So even if he somehow got the Founding Titan, he still wouldn't see the world like Yuri did because he would not be bound by the vow. So in both of those cases, we sort of have the peace option. And lastly, we have Aaron himself, the ultimate threat in all of this, so his constant presence in these scenes more so becomes a warning. They can do their back and forth of who gets the Titans and whatnot, but at the end of the day, the one who is currently chained up would be the one to wield the ultimate form of that same power. Had Kenny worked with Rod right up until the end and Historia actually ate Aaron, there would be no rumbling because again, vow. But because Aaron stands in between, the rumbling happens. And if you like really, really want to go in on overanalyzing, there's another argument to be made that all of these crystal pillars are just these strings throughout Parody that the puppet master that is the Founding Titan can pull on. You know, in the same way that Aaron's Founding Titan resembles a marionette. We then jump on over to the mid card, giving us a little bit of lore on the Titan screams. First off, note the wording of some. It purposely leaves it vague because there's still Zeke, who too has a scream of his own that would, let's say, change just a few things. This one only talks about the lesser titans, the female titan, and of course the founding titan, and its ability to alter human memories. And if you return to that angle of Eren dreaming of Frida, and Historia simply not having any memories of Frida, at this point, there's a nigh-endless list of theories you could start writing up. I remember when we were watching the series for the first time, a friend of mine picked up on the fact that, during the season 2 episode, also titled Scream, Eren might have already somehow altered people's memories. A theory that, in hindsight, did actually nail the whole Dina being a royal part, but it obviously wasn't totally accurate. That said though, I do still think the idea was really really neat. We talk so so much about perspectives in Attack on Titan. So imagine a twist where we suddenly learn that our perspective was entirely warped by Aaron already or something along those lines. I guess we do get something like that with Grisha, and it does kinda go against Eren's character to be fair, but I think it'd be really really neat if like everyone's memories were altered and it's just like Mikasa, Historia, and Levi all figuring out that, wait, something doesn't add up, why are you guys talking about this, this is not true. But yeah, even if you were to now go back to the very first episode where Eren already saw the flowers, then what looked like a burnt Helos and everything else, you can already suspect that more visions are definitely to follow. It's just another case of the series introducing a concept that explains something surface level, in this case Historia's memories, but in reality, that seemingly simple concept bleeds into absolutely everything we've already seen and we are still yet to see. Returning to the episode, we get a scene with Zachary and Aureal, and yeah. If you remember all the talk we had around both sides engaging in equally spicy methods, well, this one certainly takes the cake. And because I know a lot of you watch these videos while eating, we won't linger on the historical basis for these methods. So um, yeah, let's just focus on the lore, because this is still Attack on Titan, and even in a scene like this, Aureal still blurts out that the blood of slaves run through Zachary, and that soon enough, he too would lose his memories. The blood of slaves are of course the Eldians, which goes all the way back to Emir. But if you recall the oddly specific guess from Levi and all that, this is just the series giving us yet another confirmation that it is indeed their bloodline that gives the ability. Oh no, CGI scouts, I'm so scared. And as Pixis walks up, he also solidifies just that, saying that, as far as they gather, the nobles and a few select other bloodlines are immune to the effects, those of course being the Ackermans. Retroactively, I think this whole scream and memory alteration debacle, much like everything we've seen from the Council already, is just a neat way of further explaining why no one has ever succeeded in their pursuit of truth. On top of being, just, well, killed, a lot of people also got their memories quite literally just taken away. 
Amnesia and memory loss as a concept is, rightfully so if you ask me, a huge red flag for many people, as it is a super artificial way of controlling information. But in a setting like Attack on Titan, I don't think it's ever used as a crush to build suspense, but rather it's interwoven as a core element of the plot. So personally, I really have no problems with it whatsoever. And also, also, because this question has already popped up like a hundred times since the series finale, no, I don't think the cabin vision are altered memories, and I don't think any of Mikas' memories for that matter were altered at all. There is a lot, and I mean a lot to unpack there, so don't worry, this isn't a 10 minute tangent, but the super TLDR is that, unlike Armin, her vision happened as she was in direct contact with Eren. So in other words, that entire vision was just because of the altered perception of time that exists within the paths. But okay, let's not even talk about that today, do not leave a comment about that today. I'll just leave that as a cliffhanger until we get there soon TM. Delete that comment and write, I don't know, cats are cool. All the big lore aside, I think the fact that even Pixis says Zachary's room is a nightmare just further speaks to all the morality quabbles we've been talking about. At this point, you almost want to start thinking about containing Zachary because the dude is enjoying this way too much for a quote-unquote good guy. It's one thing getting a little bit of monkey brain payback and questioning them, but this is crossing all sorts of lines, like seriously all of them. Especially considering that none of them seem to be hiding anything as, again, they just assume that they'll wipe their memories all over again as soon as Historia eats Eren. So just like with the coup d'etat, I think Pixis here really is the only true neutral, with him vocalizing those exact fears. He straight up says, we just overthrew the government, but I'm already starting to have doubts. Later in Season 4, this would of course become an even greater worry, until eventually it would already be too late. Though Pixis also says that he remembers a song about a day when humans would stop fighting. Songs are one of those things that I think are perfect tools to embody cultures and really life as a whole. Other authors like George R. R. Martin with the Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones series, as well as Tolkien with Middle Earth, both use songs to illustrate life and the challenges people face. In the Tolkien verse, for example, the music of Ainur, I think that's how you say it, I literally listened to the Silmarillion and I still don't remember any of these words, I have no idea how you pronounce them. But yes, that was a song before time itself began. So it's again that idea of music and song embodying everything from hope to historic events to sorrow and everything in between. These songs just symbolize life. And with Pixis being our old wise dude, I think it's just a neat little touch. Though Erwin notes that humans will only stop fighting when there's a single one left. Which you know like, yeah you do have a point. I know I constantly joke about Attack on Titan being just a depressing cycle of death. And while I do think that it is definitely true, I also think that Mikasa's The World is a Cruel Place but also Beautiful sort of puts a important spin on Erwin's statements. Fundamentally, I do think the story is a, I don't even want to call it pessimistic, it's a realistic perspective on the world. There can be peace, sometimes for a year, sometimes four, sometimes a hundred. But eventually, even just one bad dude will show up and conflict will be back. But even if that is true, if there is any hope of ever stopping that cycle, you shouldn't live as if you are just constantly in the liminal period between these conflicts. There is beauty in this ugly world, and there are songs of times when there was indeed peace. But okay, I said it wasn't totally depressing, but like, unless we become a hive mind or something, there will always be that one Richard. We all know that one Richard, right? Are you that Richard? If your name is Richard, think about yourself real quick. Are you that Richard who ruins everything? If you are, please change and grow as a person. Though with that, Erwin once again puts on the wings and the mission to save Eren and Historia is now in full swing. In the meantime, we jump on over to Levi's squad where he warns everyone that, more than likely, Kenny is stronger than even Levi himself. If you ask me, Isayama was probably like, annoying power scalers will constantly keep going on about who is stronger, the master or the trainee, so I'll just literally make him say it. The odds won't be entirely in Kenny's favor. His squad is well trained, but we have way more combat experience. No, Armin, stop it, come on, it didn't even work, people are still comparing them. Though they then just start talking about all the Ackerman mysteries. In terms of persecuting them, that is obviously just a matter of control. They can control all the Eldians except them, so naturally, you just want to get rid of the ones you can't control. As for Mikasa's mom, that is the Atsuma Bito family, who too were immune to the Founding Titan, not because of any Ackerman connection or anything like that, but rather because they simply weren't even subjects of Amir. Unfortunately for Mikasa, she just so happens to be right in the middle of both of them, which, you know, is not great. Levi then talks about that awakened power, asking whether Mikasa has ever felt it. 
We talked a whole bunch about all of this with the cabin scene way, way back in episode 6. Particularly with the whole headache angle, which we now know to have been a byproduct of Amir forcefully prying into her head while the Ackerman blood is pushing her out. But for the sake of time, I won't rehash all that again. But one thing I do want to note now that the anime is over and- I'm not afraid anymore! I said I'm not afraid anymore! It turns out the manga just straight up says that Ackermans are effectively titans in human bodies. Zeke just casually mentions that they are byproducts of some sort of titan science. The scene happens while they're still in Marley and he's just casually chatting to Magath, so he doesn't really have any motive to lie. And like, I went back to the anime, I scrubbed through all of these scenes, why is this not mentioned in the anime? It's kind of important information. But yes, that lightning zapping all around her, that is indeed the same titan lightning and the impossible strength that a titan would normally have is just manifesting through their human bodies. The only thing I didn't really dive too deep into back in episode 6 is how their awakenings really work. And to be fair, even now, they do remain somewhat ambiguous. Mikas' dad was just killed instantly, so if he hadn't awakened yet, well, that makes sense. But then again, if they were already chased around a whole bunch, it makes you wonder what has to be the trigger that really awakens that latent power. And purely hypothetically, if he had already awoken it, would some superhuman reaction time kick in once he saw the knife? Is there a scenario where he is never struck by the blade and fights back? I think there's lots and lots of discussion to be had there, but personally, I do kind of think that leaving that bit of lore unexplained is probably for the best. Some magic is just better left as, well, magic. And speaking of, we then jump on over to Kenny and his grandpa, where too we get a whole bunch of lore. He knows that the Ackermans were effectively Kingsguard. Again pointing to that Titan experimentation angle and how this secret super soldier clan might have originated. I mean, think about it, if he thought feeding Amir to his daughters was a good idea, surely he had similar, unsavory ideas. But just like with the Awakenings themselves, I am a huge proponent of not explaining the true origins, so personally, I'm kinda glad that his grandpa too is just like, yeah, I have no idea. With a lot of these magical forces, I feel like giving any explanation will immediately demystify something that should be kept sort of untouchable, if you will. Another shameless self-plug, but I talk a whole bunch about it in the context of Legend of Korra and Book 2, as I think that is a really good example of technically not changing the story or dabbling with the origins of anything, but simply the act of explaining what it is immediately breaks the illusion that was once there. It's not a matter of a good explanation or a disappointing explanation or any explanation, it's just a matter of breaking the illusion. And the same goes for the Ackerman lineage, the source of all living things itself, the origin of the paths, and a bunch more of these abstract forces we see in Attack on Titan. Like, I've seen a bunch of people say they want to know what the source of all living things actually is, but like, how much deeper do you want to go? It is already a magical thing that creates titans, do you want to see like the chemical compounds it's made out of? What are you talking about? Please, let's not explain magic. Magic is magic, it's cool. We get like 90% very concrete, very reliable, very scientific explanations to just about everything. But I think it's those crucial last 10% that we can only really wonder about that make the world immersive and just feel magical. In the same way we can look out at space and wonder what else is out there, that is the vibe the story is going for. Naturally, we want to know everything, but I don't think we should. Take the ODM gear for example. Super broadly speaking, the world of Attack on Titan is very grounded. But just by adding this single thing in the ODM gear, it instantly makes the world feel a lot more magical without upsetting that initial perception of this being a mostly realistic story. Ditto for something like Game of Thrones. It is a fantasy story, but even all the old god stuff is all grounded in human conflict and we never touch the magical forces. But okay, that's like big fantasy stuff. That aside, we get a few more hints towards Levi's upbringing in the underground. But more importantly for now, we just see Kenny's perspective on life with him saying that there's no point in being born in a world like this. The concept of just being born and the importance of life is of course a very important through line throughout the later stages of Attack on Titan. Everything from the saying of you being special just because you were born, to the Amir slash Krista story and the loving mother, eventually to his story as baby and the countless other examples. But the point in all that is that it conveys a purpose. They try to shape the world for better for that new life. With Kenny, on the other hand, it is the direct opposite. At this point in the flashback, Peep has no purpose whatsoever. After meeting Yuri, however, he gains a whole new perspective on life. He desperately wants to see that almost enlightened vision of true inner peace. Only he will never be able to, because number one, he's an Ackerman, and number two, he doesn't have royal blood. 
Though we then jump back to Levi's squad who have reached the chapel, but more importantly, we also see Kevin giving a speech. I think this one is very deliberately meant to establish a super stark contrast to Erwin's speech we'd get later in Shiganshina. Kevin's speech is very nihilistic. She talks about them living meaningless lives in a meaningless world, but then stating that if Kenny's dream can change this world, well, then we will fight right up until the very end. With Erwin, on the other hand, it is the complete opposite. Sure, Aaron is very important, but their joint dream is not hingent on a single person. As he himself would say, they all die, but that does not mean their lives are meaningless. The dead have meaning because they, the living, refuse to forget them. They are not giving up their meaningless lives in a meaningless world for some grand vision. No, they march towards certain death knowing the burden they carry and knowing what they are fighting for. As is very often the case in Attack on Titan, is just another example of exploring both sides of the conflict, their motivations and worldviews. Because, you know, the thing is, as much as their entire secret murderous MP shtick is, well, not great, Kenny's dream is actually far, far better than our supposed protagonist Eren, right? Kenny's dream is one of true inner peace, to become a benevolent figure with absolutely no malice in his heart, a person not tainted by the cruelty of this world. Aaron, on the other hand, is the inverse of all of those things. Definitely some interesting mirroring going on there. Though to finish off the episode, we get another classic ominous line from Levi that also functions as a callback to the start of the season. With what they're starting right now, he tells everyone that they are all going to dirty their hands. It's basically him just saying, we've been through this with Armin, if all of you are still here, know what we're going to do, this will get bloody. And on that ominous note, that is episode 43. Another one allowing us to briefly dip into some Founding Titan timey-wimey shenanigans just before we get into the big action piece with the Rod Ross Titan. But yeah, this is definitely one I remember watching with just my mouth wide open. What's even funnier is that I can now say the Grisha twist and this isn't even the wildest Grisha twist in the series. But anyway, next time we're getting right into the Battle of the Crystal Catacombs and also some casual Founding Titan imagery. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Super excited to jump into all the Founding Titan timey-wimey shenanigans, but it does seem like the double episodes of old are a distant memory now. Who knows, maybe some of the episodes around Shiganshina will be a tad shorter, but I don't really imagine that being the case. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Spubbly, or Spoobly, I don't know, and Hourglass420. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye